Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Andre from the Opinionated Podcast, and I just want to remind you that we are live every Sunday on our Facebook page, and you can find us wherever you stream your music at the Opinionated Podcast. So we drop a new episode every Tuesday. So remember to like, share, comment, and don't forget to subscribe. Enjoy the show. We should be going live. Hey, everybody! Welcome to the Opinionated Podcast, and we are your host. I'm Cool Kev, Kevin Arant, and I'm Andre, and we have a special guest today. Is it going different? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't know that was my cue, but yeah, that's my name, different D I F E R N T. And thank you guys so much for having me on the Opinionated Podcast. Happy to be here. No doubt. Absolutely, no doubt. we appreciate you. Happy to have you. Um, so, um, we have a bit of a uh, what do you call it? Uh, like a, a script that we stick to. We're going to go a little bit, you know, back and forth. But uh, can you just tell us about yourself? Sure. Um, well, my, like I said, my name is different. I'm 31 years old. I'm from Houston, Texas, Fifth Ward to be exact. I'm a motivational speaker. I'm an author and I'm a CEO of my own business, Third Eye Entertainment, a business that strives to bring social awareness to society through products and services in which we educate, motivate and entertain all at once. Great. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm about to say, usually uh, we have to kind of pull a little bit more out of our guests, but I don't think we had to right there. Nah, nah. So um, if you don't mind, you know, the book, I think you said the book, what if, if you don't mind speaking on it a little bit without giving too much away with it, can you tell us what it's about? You know, just a snap. Well, in a nutshell, before I give, go too deep into it, I must disclose that it is intended for a mature audience only. It's a basically a grown folk for, for grown folks only. I tell people I deal with them, if you can't take this heat, don't come to this kitchen. Um, but my book, What If a Controversial Paradigm Shift, is a book that I had written to inform and encourage thought-provoking conversations about injustice and systemic racism in America. And I've done this through graphic and provocative illustrations. In excuse me, What If provides a different perspective, detailing controversial deaths and events that have occurred in America and I've done this through four main paradigm shifts. We have hypothetical, excuse me, historical, political, president, and then hypothetical paradigm shifts. And within each of these paradigms, I asked the seven questions. What if, you know, basically if the shoe was on the other foot, how would you feel? And so, you know, with these questions and these illustrations, they're meant to make people think. They're meant to, you know, help stimulate the conversations that are often swept under the rug that people don't like to talk about. And so, you know, feel free to chime in, you know, because I can't, you know, go deep into it. So if you need no, to stop we, it. But- no, we're gonna no, go we deep. we're gonna go deep because I got a bunch of things on my mind. The first thing is we just passed everybody was February, which is Black History Black Month. History Month. I yep. always me personally, I have a problem with not being I don't have a problem because it's Black History Month. I have a problem with it's like our history is more than a month. And why are we only segregated to the shortest month of the year? I think it should black history should go year round. You know, we we've been here, we've been brought over. Yeah, we've been brought over here pretty Mm -hmm. much before any anybody else before they start immigrating to this country. We was here first. Mm. You know. When okay. the first England, when the English settlers came over here, they couldn't get the uh, Indians to be slaves because they knew the path. Native how, Americans, the Native Americans, mm. they couldn't get them to become slaves because they knew how to escape. They knew the the routes to get away, so they went and got people from another land, mm. us Africans. So we was is pretty much them, and then we came after. So how do you? Yeah, you don't. Yeah. yeah. So how do you feel about the whole Black History Month thing? Do you think it should be more than a month? Or you think it's oh, just absolutely. for me is I'm I'm it's black history three sixty five is it's it's more than just a it's a month, it's it's a mindset, it's it's what you have it in your heart, you know. You wake up black. For me, um I have to deal with this, you know, every day of my life, not just you know, the month of February. As as far as you know, being acknowledged by the world, you know, within that sense of the month of February, at least we have that, but for me. I celebrate Black History Month every single day of my life, you know, being a Black woman, you know, letting it be known that I'm Black and proud to be that person. Um, even with the book that I've written, it's, it, I will say this, it will ruffle some feathers, it will ring some bells, but the gist of this book, for those who are mature enough to make it through the first three paradigms, historical, political, and precedent, and make it to hypothetical, I, that is where I tie in the main points of what if 
you know, this generation was a seed that plants the seed for the next generation to come together and talk about, you know, the things that need to be, you know, adjusted and changed in America and acknowledged. Yeah, I understand that change does not happen overnight and it doesn't happen with just one person. But what if, guys, what if this is a generation that starts it? And so with my book, I have everybody included, you know, even Native Americans. I pay homage to them, even the LGBTQ community, even Muslims and Hispanics, they're also included in this book. So it's not just about black and white, it's about all coming together as a unity and as in one. Mm-hmm. You know, why not show love and kindness to one another, you know, because we're all going through something personally, be, you know, you know, our mental health, our financial health, you know, struggling with relationship wise, you know, physical health, we're all going through something, you know, on the inside. So why not practice kindness and love to one another when you walk past somebody instead of judging them based off the way they look? Or their skin color. And so to tie in that question of if, how do I feel about Black History Month and it, it only being celebrated just in that, that time frame for only, you know, 24, 28 days, excuse me, that, that's only a mindset for them. What you might, Black history is what you make it in your mind. For me, I celebrate it every day, you know, letting it be known that I'm Black and I'm proud and, and just showing that um, I, I come from kings and queens. If I'm making any sense to you guys, it's it's, oh, it's absolutely. You, you don't have to stop celebrating just because it ended in the month of February. I'm still celebrating it for me. You know, I'm still going around, you know, promoting my blackness and you know what what the culture has done for this world. And so, yeah. just because it stopped in the month of February doesn't mean it has to stop. You you it's up to us to keep it going. And so yep. they may not remember, but it's on us to not let them forget. So. Yeah, right. You you're right because we are the we are the culture. We right are now. the culture, and which which is crazy, man. What you said about it being controversial because a lot of America don't want to see the stuff that they they do to us. Every time something happens with, mm-hmm. say, an officer or, or laws being put into place, it's like you know, it's always pull yourself up by the bootstraps or what did you do? Mm-hmm. The whole George Floyd thing, which was sad woke America up but to us in the black community that was it's a natural normal. that was a natural occurrence we see that all the time we, it's we not natural. It's, it's, no I won't say it's natural I would say it's normal no, normal it's, it, it, yeah but that's the right word yeah, because, yeah well, natural. it's funny that you said they mentioned George Floyd because this is the reason how this book came about you know being stuck in the house during the pandemic beforehand I was an avid traveler and I traveled all over the world and being stuck in the house and dealing with my depression, there's nothing that I can do. And then May 25th, 2020 happens. The day of the world has has to watch this man, George Floyd, die on live stream, you know, on, t- on, on, the, on their phones and computers or whatever. And they see this. What well, we, nor- we're seeing, you know, that's normal for us. And so in my mind, you know, he's from Houston as well. Is, and so I'm from Fifth Ward, he's from Third Ward. We're the neighborhoods right next to each other. So when they started marching and protesting, I wanted to get involved. However, I wanted my voice to be heard longer than just in that moment of time. I wanted it to be heard long after I'm gone. And so asking God, what is it that I can do to have the, my voice being heard? And it's going to make people think this is what he showed me. And so in homage, I even have a paradigm for him asking the question, what if George Floyd was a white man that was, held by, you know, um, had his, uh, excuse me, a knee on his neck by a black police officer for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And people will see that illustration and it makes you think, what if? And, you know, from the reviews that I'm getting from people, a lot of the, the people that are saying, you know, it's the truth that people don't want to see, but needs to be seen. So, you know, for those who say, oh, this book is meant for, you know, a tool for the black community to uprise against, you know, the white community. No, it's not. It's simply meant to make you think, make you, you know, have that conversation that needs to be had. What if, what if the shoe was on the other foot? And even though I'm talking about, you know, historical paradigms and political paradigms, what's going on right now has, is still occurring, you know? So that's why we keep bringing up the past. A lot of times, I don't want to say white people, but, you know, a certain section of those people, you know, want to say, well, only reason why racism is so alive because you guys are keeping it alive, or how can racism be alive when all those black people are starting to get their own businesses and doing so well? <laughs> well, this is how you can see that it's still alive and well. When, you know, you you walking down the street and you see a black person walking next to you, you as a you know white person walking down the street and you see a, per- a black person walking next to you, 
You don't know them, they don't know you, but all of a sudden you're clutching your phone, you're grabbing your purse and your belongings, and you're thinking they're going to rob you and do you wrong. And you don't know this person from the next, but yet you're passing judgment based on the color of their skin. You're automatically thinking they're a thug or they're up to no good just because that's their notion. And that's how you know that systemic racism is still alive in America and it needs to be changed. Well, you can, this is how you know America still has racism in it. You have, you have white people, they're considered American. American, that's it. American, straight American. Right. Then you have black people, we're considered what they want to consider is a good term for us, African American, Asian American, Hispanic American, uh, Mexican American. This is how they label us. But at the end of the day, I never, nothing, Africa is my homeland. I've never been there. This is where my ancestors came from. They came from Africa. I've never been to Africa a day in my life. As far as I've I'm concerned, if yeah, I was like, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, I'm from Jersey. I'm from Jersey. That's where I'm from. I'm, I'm American. I ain't, you know what I'm saying? Just like uh like a white man, just like a white man, he can be Russian. You don't hear him call Russian Russian American, or he could be Italian, you know, say he's Italian American, or he's Irish, he's Irish American. No, he's just an he's an American. Even Americans that have been here, they call them Native Americans. Right. This mm -hmm. was their this was their land, this was their country. Y'all mm -hmm. came and took that. Y'all pretty much this is how they did. This is how, in my opinion, how they did Native Americans. They came to Native Americans' house and said, here, this. we walk to your house. We're going to take your house. We're going to force you guys to go live in the attic. Hmm. Okay, my house is getting dirty and I need it clean. I'm going to go across the street and get these black, these Africans that's across the street. Then I'm going to come and force them to come in this house and clean this house hmm. for me to keep it maintained. But while you're staying in this house, you are forced to live in the basement. This is our house. Mm. Then when it gets time, took. yeah, that we took. We took right. it from the, the Native Americans that was here. We made them live in the attic. We gave them a smaller space, but we gave them their little bit. Of like, it's in the attic. Right. We got the main house. Africans, you can clean this house. You can't stay in the main house. You have to be. You have to live in the basement. Right. But then when when they said we're free, they said how would they say free? Okay, you can come up for the from the basement periodically. Don't touch this. Don't touch this. You want to eat something out of the refrigerator? No, nah, that's my food. Uh, here, go eat these leftovers or whatever I got here. That's for y'all. This, this y'all can never touch that. All the good stuff in the house that's for us. Y'all can have the hand me downs. That's how. That's how my view of America is. I okay. I feel like you giving them the basement is just being nice. No, no, because they the wasn't even getting the no, basement. We, no, yeah. You get what I'm saying, you but know, you get yeah, what I'm yeah, saying. They wasn't even getting the basement. I'm just saying you're just getting you're not you're you you're not allowed to partake in the main house. We gave the people that house we stole from them. You go live in the attic. We're gonna have the main house. We're gonna go get these people across the street to maintain our house. And they're not even gonna be allowed allowed to be. That's how I look at America, man. So that's my viewpoint of America. So I, how, how do you feel about that? I agree, I agree with the paradigm, what you're saying, in, in the sense of how, as far as, I see it as mental bondage in a sense now. But but let me ask you this. Knowing what we know now and, and, and having the opportunity, what, we, what we've what we seen now, what we've be been given now and in this time frame, mm. What are we going to do as a, as a community? Because we already see what they've been doing to keep us down. Knowing what we know now and having the resources that we have now and knowing what we can do now as far as, you know, going back to school or, or starting our own college or, excuse me, our own business and, and things like that. I don't, I don't want to pit nobody when I say this question, but no, in a sense, uh, I, hold on, let, let, me, let me show this with you, with you guys in the sense I've been sharing with everybody else. And, and this paradigm can be applied to the Black community as far as what we went through in the past, it may have not been our fault, it's out of our control, but somehow, some way, it's our problem to deal with. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Yes. Say that. That's what I had to learn when I went to get my mental health in check. What I went through as a child, that traumatization, it wasn't my fault. It wasn't my, it was out of my control, but as an adult, it's on me to deal with. And as a black community, having, you know, the white man's foot on our neck so long, 
and, and knowing now the power that we have within ourselves and recognizing our own strengths and, and how many of us have come up so now and starting our own business. What are we going to do now knowing what the problem is? How are we going to free ourselves from this mental bondage? All right. So. Is, as far as they're going to they're do what they're going to do as far as keeping us down, holding us back and keeping right. us in that bondage. What are we as a people of the black community going to do to free ourselves from that bondage, from their bondage? Okay, and how and now I see how this uh, how how I look at how it goes. I see, I look at if you ever see Chinatown in Philadelphia. Is a Chinatown mostly in all the major cities? Yeah, those yeah, people, one the they're on the outside. Yeah, they have their own their own their own, their own section. My mom, she drives her the transit buses out here. She used to pick a lady up that lived forty minutes about forty minutes away, maybe an hour by bus to get to Chinatown. That's how she. If, she would say she my mom would pick her up and she actually why you don't go you know walmart's right up the street why you don't go shopping here and she's like i go with my people's at mm. I, I go with my mm -hmm. people that's where my people at if you ever go in chinatown's police walking around there they're nice and they, they're kind to them they're good to them because america races america don't see anything but green and for us and for for black america for black america to become their own thing we got to start we got to have our version of a Chinatown yeah, where own. we where we go to yeah. where we keep that, our money that. where we keep yeah, where we keep our money <clears throat> well circulating and circulating with, 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 circulating circulating with, with me correct we we were yeah, at one I, point I, having I, that I, and then I understand at, at times when we were building something like that it got, it it got was destroyed yeah, exactly we yeah. got to do but listen <laughs> yes sir yeah, so we got it, but yeah, you're right. You just can't, but it happened. So we how? Can't. So the question Wait, is, how do the we question, do it? The yeah. question is, how do we accomplish it in unity? Uh, me that's, and the next that's man. That's what I'm getting. That's what I'm getting to. But that's why I'm, I'm. That's what I'm getting at, man. I'm, I'm waiting. I'm trying to get there. We we have. <laughs> I got you, bro. Yeah, yeah. We we have that. We had. We have. We if we was to invest if. But we had millionaires, all these millionaires, you know what I mean, come back to their community where they started at and start putting money back in their community, start taking care of their schools in their neighborhood. I think that's where it starts. It starts at the schools. It starts at the school. So I take care of your school, the parents going down to these, these meetings, because a lot of people don't realize when they, when say a city, say a city like around our way, uh, say Camden County, everybody in Camden County is paying taxes. Mm -hmm. Okay, most of the money that's getting paid in camp, you know, as far as the taxes, it goes to goes to the rich neighborhoods. All most of the resources go to the rich neighborhoods where we're not allowed in. We're left with the leftovers, and we're left to put together in our schools these old books, this old knowledge. The teachers that work there, they're underpaid. They don't care nothing about the students. The parents that some of the parents that have the kids there. You have parents that care, but some of the parents don't. They just like, whatever, my kid's going to school. Who cares? You know, I got to work. I got stuff to do. Okay. It starts there. Right. It starts at the school, building our kids, talking to our kids. Like, look, man, be proud of who you are. You take care of your people. You always look after your people. When you, we start building a business, don't go to somebody's business. Uh, I think we lost to asking for a, a, a discount and stuff like that. So Here's my thing when it comes to that, because I don't want to stop you from going on for going where you're going, but I want to like add to it. So starting in the schools is also the education in the schools as well. And I'm not going to pretend like I know a whole bunch, but I think if you go by today's education, I, I can tell you right now that my the education that I received was not an adequate education to be in a successful businessman or you know somebody who can who can start something you you either have to know someone who has already gone that path or you really have to have the drive and i'm gonna tell you coming from the neighborhoods that i came from it's not a lot of people who have that drive you think i'm, I'm speaking from myself we think that getting paid twenty dollars at the time twenty dollars an hour was like, oh my gosh, if you get paid $20 an hour, you have a great job. Don't ever leave that job. And I'm not saying that that's not great now. What I'm saying is that's where you're taught to aim for. So when you get there, like all of us have surpassed that at this point, when you get there, you're like, oh shit, this isn't exactly where I thought it was. What else is, what else is, 
is is past this and it's not i'm not talking about money i'm talking about being able to be successful be be successful do things for your community be you know what i mean like be be there in a way where you can teach the Whoa. next person I, i'm still going hold on one second i'm sorry um because i'm gonna finish the thought and then i want you to keep going i'm sorry All right, cool. um so being able to teach the next person your your kids your nephews your nieces the the right way to do it or a different way to do it than what you were taught and i think when you talk about the educational system and what they teach us that's where it starts at because not only us even even the white you know i can't, hate to say that the affluent people because it's not just white it could be indian it could be anything are taught the same cuz i had a whole lot of white classmates but they are also influenced by their family yeah who is in that particular position who can guide them the right way. So I think that's where it starts at is education and getting taught a different way than what we're well, all getting taught now. All right. Well, I, I say that. End uh, of my thought. Okay. So I'm going to start my thought. We was, we was going, that, we, we was going, we was going in that direction. When we first be, got out of, there we go. We first, when black people first got hey, out you of, take it, you take it. we first got out of slavery and everything like that. We started that. We started when black people first got out of slavery, sorry. Yeah, there we go. When we first got hey, out of slavery. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. I'm back. Can you hear me? Oh, good. We got now, you. we was talking about how <laughs> we fine. come out of the situation. And Dre was saying, like, he, he went to school. The educational system. The educational man. system. I am saying to him, like, black people, when we first got out of slavery, we started, like, you know, America, That, like you said, we started building towns and everything. We was keeping everything in our community. We were starting to get there. And all this, you know, every time we got knocked down, we kept getting there. And then mm -hmm. they will always try to even we was getting to a point we built. When people people don't realize Bloods and Crips didn't start off as a gang. They started off as they were just protecting their neighborhood from cops coming in. Black Panthers, everything. Every time we started building like that, they always sent somebody in there to destroy it or take it down or or mislead us or misguide us. It sometimes it's our own people. What we gotta start doing is like, look, we can't. We all got to get on one page and one accord right now. At this time right now, we should if we think what we're making right now is not good enough for our kids. Start teaching our kids, pointing them into the right direction to say, hey, listen, when you grow up, you're going to become a cop. You're going to become a judge. Listen to me. I'm going. Well, I was about to agree with nah, you. Yeah, you're going to give you an example. Nah, but go nah, ahead. I'm sorry. I'm saying. You're gonna give it, but put, <laughs> start putting our. But start putting our. Start putting people who look like us in the same mindset as our kids in these high ranking positions. Well, put, that, they, they do that. In America. That's what my. That's what my Asian brothers and sisters, my okay. Indian brothers and I know. sisters. That's, what, that's they, what they do. We have to do the same thing. Start putting ourselves. In I agree position. with you guys. But you know, let, let me piggyback off of that in regards to my question and, and tagging on to you guys' answer in regards to how we as a black community rise above it. Here's my theory of it. First, we have to free ourselves from that mental bondage that we had been locked in for so long. That means getting our mental health in check and being adult, when adult, uh, being an adult about it and mature enough to say, hey, we need to go and fix these psychological issues that we may have. And for me, it was a childhood traumatization. So when I went through what I did and I had to go and get that, you know, in check, I was able to free myself from that mental bondage and do what I had to do. And nothing and nobody was able to stop me. So as a whole, as one, I would say in, 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 in order for us to come up and rise above it, we would have to get our mental health in check for one. That means going to fix whatever it plagued us in our past, you know, whatever traumatization we had been through, go get that in check. And not necessarily meaning talking with therapists. Sometimes you can just talk with a family member or a friend or go pick up a hobby. I always tell people as, in regards to, you know, feeling mental anguish, it's okay to not be okay but just don't sit there and not be okay. And so as far as with the black community, a lot of us, including myself, I grew up being taught what goes on in this house stays in this house. And that's very true. But if it's something that's bugging me on the inside, that's eating away at me to where a point where I can't sleep at night or look at myself in the mirror, or I can't move forward in life, then I'm going to go get that shit. Sorry, go get that fixed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> else say <laughs> and so you know I, that's what I had to do I had to say I had to dismiss that notion that you know black people don't do therapy and I went and got therapy and talked about my issues and got myself in check and realized you know what it was that was holding me back 
and how it was taking control over me. And once I was able to do that, I was able to, you know, move forward in life. Not saying that every day in my life is is, is grand and it, I still have good days and bad days. As a matter of fact, I'm still going through depression. My mother died in my arms the day after Christmas in 2021. So rest in peace to my mother, Rancho Schoenberg. Peace. And so as far as, you know, with healthy grieving is being real about it and talking about it with people. Even though I don't know you guys out there, y'all don't know me from a can of paint. I'm not, I know I'm not the only one going through this out there. And so me sharing my story and talking about what's really eating about it away at me, I know it's somebody out there that hears me and they can understand what I'm going through and my story will help them and let them know that they are not alone. And then a lot of times people reciprocate to me that they're going through the same thing. And so me sharing my story with others and, and putting my business out there in the sense has been therapeutic for me. You know, it saved me from going off the deep end. And a lot of times in the black community, we don't like to talk about our mental health and its anguish and how it leads mm. to, you know, suicide in the black community. But I'm here to tell you guys right here and now, anybody out there that's feeling, you know, suicidal and thinking that it's the end, it's not. If you live in, in the States right here and now, if you need this number, call it 1-800- uh, 273-8255 that's the number to the suicide hotline just know it's okay to not be okay but don't sit there and not be okay in my business third eye entertainment we advocate and push for you know mental health awareness and just especially within the black community because that's going to be the first step it takes to freeing ourselves from the white man's bondage if you will and bettering ourselves it's just facing up into the, you know getting our mental health in check and then secondly Moving on to our physical health, getting our physical health in check as far as hitting that gym, cut out eating all those fatty foods and, and dealing with our high cholesterol and hypertension, the things that are the number one killers that's taking the black people off the map when it comes to our health. You know, we, we're high stats when it comes to heart attacks, strokes, hypertension, and that all comes for, you know, not taking care of our bodies and eating all that salt and greasy foods. And, and it may have been okay back in the day. But knowing what we know now and knowing that the type of damage it does to our body, when you know better, you do better. That's what it's going to take for us as a black community to come out of that mental bondage. And, and as far as thirdly, it's coming together as one, as a unity. Not no dark skin, not no light skin, not no mulattoes and all that. We all the same. We come, we come from kings and queens, you know, from Africa. And so no matter if, you know, down the line, you know, our ancestors was raped and we got some white in our family, we still part of that 1%, you know, even if you, you don't think you are, you, you is. And so, <laughs> and not holding each other back, holding each other down and reminding each other that we have a crown on our head, on our head, instead of knocking it off each other's head, helping one another to fix it and shape it up at times. That's what it's going to take, guys. That's been, as, as well as, you know, Coming together financially, stop, you know, getting gaining financial literacy, you know, mm -hmm. taking those and learning, you know, the terminology as well as, you know, bettering yourself and, and just understanding and accepting that, you know, it's the power is on you. What you went through in life, as, even as a child, as an adult, it may or may not been your fault. It was out of your control. But, you know, just how it works in life is your problem to deal with. And it's on you to fix. You can't blame the white man. You can't blame your parents. You can't blame, you know, this, that, and the third for why you didn't make it. If, if there's no opportunities given to you, you go out there and take it. You know, when I was old, I ended up homeless with me and my family. We ended up living on the streets for three years, living in shelters, bus stops, cars, parks, strangers' house, even a crack house at one time. And it wasn't until the age I was 14, a family member secretly placed me in foster care and for six months, nobody knew where I was. And within that time frame, I found out through another foster kid that if you age out, the state of Texas would pay for your way to college. And so mm. right then and there, a light bulb went out and I had to use my street smarts to elevate my book smarts. And, you know, what I went through in, in those four years of CPS, it was hell, but it was worth it because I ended up, you know, getting my degree from Sam Houston State University. I have a bachelor's degree in international business, two mm. minors in economics and business communications. A few years later, I got my master's degree in entrepreneurship. I'm a Texas real estate agent. You know, I'm an author, a motivational speaker. I, I've traveled all over the world and I own my own business now. And so, like I said, yeah. I, 
whatever you went through in life, it wasn't your fault. It was out of your control. Okay, that may be true, but it's on you to deal with. It's on you to, to take control of the reins of your life and take back your power. Because at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, and it's time for you to say goodbye and leave this world, it's going to be on you how you lived your life. You can't blame the next person and say, well, they held me back. I had so many chances. I would have made it at this and that. And if the opportunity is not given to you, you go out there and take it. Go make you one. My motto for Third Eye Entertainment is manifest, plan, prepare. In order yeah. for those who believe they are destined for greatness in life, you have to manifest. Speak it into existence like no other. Remove yeah. all the doubt, all the fear, and replace it with faith. Get it in your head, even if you have to fake it until you make it. Secondly, plan for it. Write it out on paper. Write out three, four plans of how you're going to achieve the goals. Write up a backup plan, an exit plan. You mm -hmm. can't be planning for the unknown. You can understand and accept that it's going to come, and you're going to have to deal with it no matter what. So that's a part of planning as well. When I say preparation or prepare, that means prepare yourself from the inside out. Going to get your house in order. So that means mentally wise go get it in check go 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 fix those issues that plagued you go cut those people off that mean you know will go mend yeah. those broken bridges go fix your financial house go fix your physical house so that way whatever you're mas manifesting for whatever you're preparing for or planning for when it comes to you you can be prepared for it so you won't squander it you will know how to handle it that was a lot of the issues i had early on in my 20s i had a lot of career opportunities coming to me but because i didn't know how to handle it or i wasn't prepared for it i was squandering oftentimes you know coming up in that background where chaos was normal for me i felt that good things were too good to be true for me so i often squander it and mess it up because i was the captain of the ship and i decided when it's time for it to go down but again, realizing and facing the ugly truth that, you know, what I went through in my past wasn't my fault, but it's on me to fix. That's what sparked me to get my mental health in check. And once I did that, that's what led to me writing the book, me starting my own business and me talking to you guys here today and spreading the message of what getting your mental health in order can do for you guys. And so Absolutely. That's, Absolutely. That's just, if you guys want to know about me, go to my website, differenceworld.net. And you can get my book there. Again, here it is. What if a controversial if? paradigm shift? A book that's written to encourage and inform thought-provoking conversations about injustice and systemic racism in America. And it's intended for a mature audience only. You can go to my website and get that copy. And so as well as if you guys would like to have for those out there listening, you can go and book me uh, for any events or grassroots conversations. I'm free of charge as of now. You can also check me out on YouTube. I have a travel channel. I share my travel excursions as well as, you know, my other podcast interviews and uh, other things I have going on. So uh, dip as well. You know, come and learn. <laughs> I feel like yeah. I talk so much. Ask me some questions. <laughs> uh, uh, I want to. Um, so um, you, now your, your book that you're writing, like where did you, you I guess you got most of your inspirations from what you see in life. Yeah, in life, uh, once came from the movie uh, The Help, uh, 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 a time ago when the, at the end when Matthew McConaughey asked the question, you know, imagine she's white. And so that kind of, you know, you know, encouraged me to say, hey, well, imagine if these were white people, what if this would happen to you? Um, I don't want to get y'all kicked off of you know, against that. Yeah, so I don't want to show you the illustrations. I go to the website and, and, oh, and buy the book illustrations. Uh, of it is, uh, well, be sure about it. You know, it will work with some feathers, it will make some people mad. But the gist of it, you will see the point that I'm trying to make. And if it makes you mad, let me ask you this question be it black or white, why is it okay that you know you see an illustration of a white man being lynched and you're upset about it, but then you turn around and you see an illustration of a black man being lynched, which was true and what happened in the past, but mm -hmm. in your essence excuses for it. Oh, it happened. Oh, get over it. It's the past. Let's move forward. But you don't want to acknowledge that it was wrong before you move past it. And so that, again, is how you can tell that, you know, systemic racism is still alive and kicking and needs to be eradicated. And talking about that, even if it means if I got to put it in your face to where you don't like it, you know, at least you know now, at least your bell has been rung and you can't unring the bell. And so that's also, you know, the point of writing this book it's just, you know, to put it out there. And, and George Floyd on the Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, 
for those you know who who die, making sure that they their name doesn't go in vain and never be forgotten, even if you know. It, this book goes nowhere fast, although that's not going to happen because I've manifest, planned, and prepared that that's this right. book will be a number one bestseller and ring the world bell. So this book, in due season, it will take off and do what it's supposed to do. It will make the world think and spark the conversation that needs to be had. And it is, again, my prayer in theory that over time, that when we have these constant conversations, not just one-time conversations, but constant conversations, about these issues and, and acknowledgement and talk about ways to come up to, to counter these, these issues, then over time, that is where you can see systemic change and systemic racism. Because quite frankly, I'm tired of talking about racism. I want to talk about systemic change. You know, and so I want to make sure, you know, my nephew, he doesn't have to grow up making sure he knows the codes of walking down the street. Okay, making sure you don't walk with a hoodie on your head. Don't sag your pants. When you look at the police, make sure you smile. It shouldn't be like that now, but we it's, it's sad to say we have to teach our, our young black boys how to, you know, handle themselves or code switch, if you will, when they're walking down the street or in a new neighborhood because, you know, they don't want to get labeled as, you know, a uh, 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 domestic yeah. terrorist or a thug. But yeah. For the black people, you know, we do things with thugs, but if it was a white person, then it's mental issues or he, he needs help or he, he's depressed. And so... Um, that's sad to say that's the way of the world that we're teaching our kids, but I want to, you know, try to put my, 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 my stake in it and make sure I do my part before I leave this earth and, and, and showing that, you know, we can change over time because I come from a multiracial family, believe it or not. My grandmother is actually a white woman <laughs> who loves her some crunchy black men. And so for me, I, I came up with everything and so I, I was just taught to be tolerant and coming up in a, the deep south, such as Texas. But I was raised in Houston, you know, a, a multi-diverse city. And so that shows you, even in, in a place like the deep south in Texas, in this place that we come up in, you, you can walk down the street, you can be a man in a dress, and nobody's going to judge you. They're just going to mind their business and keep it moving forward. And so in a little place like this in Houston, in the deep south like this, if it can be like this in, in this little place, then why not in the entire world? And so the best one to take, you know, acknowledgement. It's going to take commitment to change and then constant, you know, commitment to change between both ends, not just with black and white, but everybody, Native yeah. Americans, Muslims, Mexicans, everybody, everybody coming together. So that's, again, that's why it's not just about black and white in this book. I want that to be known. It's something here for everybody to take away from it, even the uh, LGBTQ community, they're included in as well. And so that, that, that again, it's intended for mature audience and those who can, who, who don't like turning a blind eye to, and, and even if they do turn a blind eye to, feel free for, unfortunately, the next protest that we'll have to have is the death of an innocent black person, but make sure, you know, you have these illustrations so that it can see what if, what if it was your family, you know, member that was on the ground having their, you know, back of the neck being stamped with a knee in it. What if? Right. Okay. I have a question, if you will. And it's, it's kind of a two-part. So um, I imagine um, within this question, you have, uh, do you have a lot of conversations with people? Do you find yourself having conversations with people about this often? And when you do, do you find them to be on the defensive more often than not? As crazy as it seems, and then I've, I've done a, a, um, a beta test beforehand to see where my audience will go because you go where you celebrate it, not where you tolerate it. Um, and then with the conversations, it's bringing out a lot of the truth of, of how some people feel. Of course, you're going to have the trolls online, you know, having their opinions with the fake accounts and stuff. And, and mm -hmm. from what I see, I know it's a lot of, you know, White women are, are, are more susceptible to uh, accepting the truth than white men. <laughs> I've noticed that from it. If, right. if, if that uh, if I seem to, but I don't. I don't want to get into no back and forth with the. I don't respond to like you know those who are trolling. I can tell if they want to really have a real conversation and whether they just want to troll. And so I don't right. respond to the trolls. those who you know really asking the question or you know trying to have the conversation and sharing their true opinions about it, then of course I'll oblige and I'll entertain and then I'll share mine because that's, again, that's the point of the book to have the conversation. But in essence of that, 
you go where you celebrate it, not where you tolerate it. I was well aware before I wrote the book that not a lot of people would like it. In fact, a whole bunch of white people would not like it. But instead of that, I'm not going to worry. One thing I've learned from number 45 is, again, you go where you celebrate it, not where you tolerate it. In the four years of this man being in office, even after he was out, he still has 75 million plus people supporting and condoning his BS. So that resonate that was, that's 25 percent of the U.S. adult population still riding for this man, right or wrong. And so that resonates to me, no matter who you are, what you are about, what you're selling to the public, somebody out there that's going to be willing to buy it. So, again, you go, we celebrate it, now we tolerate it. So I'm not worried about the trolls and the naysayers and people that don't like what I have to say about this book. I know it's people out there that's going to feel me and understand where I'm coming for, especially in my in my culture, you know, with the black people. They're going to understand it more than, they, than the other people. Right. And so, so, again, while I'm with you guys and talking with you guys about it and, and out there with the audience out there that's listening, it's my hope and prayer that you guys go out and get this book and check it out and share your opinions about it and post your reviews so others can hear about it as well. So again, go to differenceworld.net, spell D-I-F-E-R-N-T-W-O-R-L-D-N. It's out there in the, in the link, so check yeah. that out. But um, that that's the point of it all, man, is to, to spread the word and spread the message and plant the seed, you know, overall for systemic change. Absolutely. Got you. All righty. Cool. Um, Okay, well, you know we're getting towards the end. Um, what are, what are your future goals and your aspirations after this book? Like, where do you see yourself within the next um, five to ten years? Well, do it like my mama said and get mine. <laughs> you know, uh, going for everything that has my name on it. Um, doing everything in her honor and in in God's honor as well, and then continue mm-hmm. to give Him the honor and glory, um, as well as with my book just manifesting, planning, and preparing for it to, like I said, become the number one bestseller, uh, win the Pulitzer Prize and the Nobel Peace Prize, as well as I'm seeing it also being turned into a miniseries. You know, hey, why not? All right. Anything is possible. You just have to manifest, plan, and prepare for it. And even if those who don't believe, all you got to do is sit back and, you know, see, come and learn is what I tell them. Um, as far as business-wise, I got a couple more events that I'm going to be doing in Houston, a couple of pop-up shops I'll be doing, you know, promoting my book, as well as um, I'll be tr- attempting to, to do it with COVID and basically how everything is working with this, just planning to see it player by ear with this year. I might be doing some uh, campuses, universities, visiting them, as well as maybe later on this fall doing a book tour. Um, so be able to look out for that. You know, I just did a radio interview um, with one of the radio stations here in Houston. So Busy, busy, busy <laughs> working as well. Mm-hmm. Got to so, get it by any means. I always <laughs> tell people, you come up like Cardi B, or they come back like Robert D. There is no more in between. So for me, I'm on that come up. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, yeah. so what if, all right, another question we always ask people, what advice would you give to people listening to this episode? What advice do you want to give to them? Or let them know. Man, love yourself, love God, and love others. And then know that it's okay to not be okay, but just don't sit there and not be okay. If you feel like, you know, you, you're destined for greatness in life, in order for you to get to that, you got to clear out all that blockage. You got to take care of anything that's stopping you or blocking you from that, including getting your mental health in check. And so take care of that as well, as well as getting your physical, your financial, as well as, you know, literacy. Going Knowledge is power. So go on and read up on anything that you're passionate about, be it the music industry, you know, trying to become viral or anything. Go do your homework and research before it. The number one rule in business I tell people in order for people to take you serious, you have to take yourself serious. And so that means doing your homework and your research on anything that it is that you want to go after. And again, manifest planning and prepare for it. Write it out on paper, how you're going to attack it, have backup plans, making sure that you can come up with the capital for that money and then you start working for it as well. Make sure you save, 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 save. And so it'll work out in the end for you. So uh, just that and, and again, give your mental health and check. Again, for anybody out there that's feeling, you know, depressed, suicidal, even dealing with bullying, uh, just know that it's okay to not be okay but just do not sit there and be okay. Go get help. Go talk with somebody. Either being a therapist, a family member, a friend, even picking up a hobby. If you need to, call this number. Be it suicidal thoughts or not. 
1-800-273-8255. That's anybody that needs somebody to talk with just to get some things off your chest. They're there to listen to you as well as you can do your uh, your own research and your homework and get online and, and, and check out some resources that, that's befitting to you guys. You got to do the work within. You know, they say faith without work is dead. So you have to right. do that work in order for you to see, you know, that, that finished product. And so don't sit there and just pray for it. And, and just think it's going to come to you. You have to get out there and get it. You just sit there hoping it to come to you. That's never going to happen. And so, again, you know, being spiritually and mentally mature about it and realistic about it will also help better the situation. So, you know, mm-hmm. that's all I have to say, you guys. Manifest plan, prepare for whatever it is in life that you want, and it will surely come to you guys. Difference world. Come and learn. All right. Word. Word. No, no. Um, all right. So, uh, I think we could go over <laughs> one more time where where we can grab the book and where people can find you just one more time before we wrap up. For sure, for sure. Go to my website, differenceworld.net. Again, it's in uh, my link, D-I-F-E-R-N-T-S, world.net. There you can find all of my videos as well as my other social media handles, my Twitter, Instagram, my YouTube channel. Definitely check it out and subscribe as well as my Facebook. Again, you can book me for any motivational speaking events or grassroots conversations you guys want me to be a part of. I'm free of charge as of now. But again, differenceworld.net. Come and learn. There we go. Right. All right. So that's all I got, guys. Uh, uh, you having me. I just want to remind you guys that y'all all three are kings, and y'all got crowns in y'all head, and y'all rocking it real. So big up to you guys, and much love to y'all. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. you. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, all right, that's all I got. All. <laughs> I, I mean, that kind of let, let me on a high note. So, uh, yeah. once again, uh, we were your host. I'm cool, Kev. I'm on this side every time. All I right, know. he doesn't like me. It's okay. <laughs> we used to be great friends. <laughs> yeah, you got too, too much white in you, uh, uh, Kevin Durant, <laughs> and I'm Andre. And we want to thank our thing. guest. Thank you, you guys for having me. Different world, y'all. Come and learn. <laughs> all righty. All right. We'll see y'all next time. Like as always, I say, man. At the end of each episode, peace. I so say, forced. I hate Thank that. you for listening yeah. to today's episode of the Pain Native Podcast. If you love today's episode, make sure to subscribe, leave a review, five stars. We don't want nothing less. If you're an artist, inspire actress, a songwriter, an author, or you're doing something that's interesting and you want to be a guest on our show, please email us at opinionatedpodcastddk at gmail.com. That's opinionatedpodcastddk at gmail.com. Thank you. Have a blessed day.